Hello again, this is Dr. Dan Guerra from the Bear of Met Studios in the American Pacific Northwest. I'm going to continue now with our second installment of this two-part series on discussing mevalonic acid and certain intermediates in the biosynthesis of isoprene lipids and how they regulate um, T lymphocytes. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So again, my name is Dr. Daniel John Guerra, and this is a video lecture from Vareb Med. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about <clears throat> certain T lymphocytes um, th uh, that some that sometimes kill and sometimes proliferate tumor cells. So they are poised as a molecular switch, basically. And this molecular switch is such that given the right circumstances, that is the specific antigens <clears throat> which associate with T cell receptor, um, those T cells a specific subclass of them, which we're going to get into here, uh, called gamma delta T cells. Those T cells will either fight tumors and be involved in anti-tumor activity uh, as infiltrating lymphocytes, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or they will actually promote tumorogenesis. And it all depends on the molecular switch involved. So this subtle difference and how signaling occurs at the T cell level will determine the fate of the tumor. So that's something that's brand new. Uh, in fact, it came out in a paper very recently in 2018. I'm recording this right after I recorded a general lecture on MVA, mevalonic acid, that is, biosynthesis, and how mevalonic acid metabolites generally control T, t lymphocyte activation. So if you haven't seen the first lecture, um, go back and watch it, please. This is the second one. This will still make sense to you if you don't watch the first one, but I think if you watch the first one, it'll be a lot easier for you to follow. All right. So anyways, I'm Danny Guerra. There is my email address. Uh, you can contact me directly there. Uh, I am the chief scientific officer and co-founder, co-owner of Vera Med. That's our website, and there is our official email address to become a client or just to have inquiries. It doesn't cost anything to um, ask questions and to talk to us and get uh, to know what we do as consultants in biomedicine. Basically, what we do, uh, to be synoptic about it, is we go directly to the primary published literature. We don't use newspapers. We don't go to magazines. We don't take any popular press material. That is vetted research evidence. And we take that uh, evidence and we verify it. We carry it through the process of hermeneutics as such that we try to determine whether or not there's foundational and coherent information in published literature with the rest of the published literature. And if that's the case, then we um, will say so and present it as basic, as basic foundational science that's currently understood, knowing that research always changes. If we don't find it, we also report that. Okay. And it can be any aspect of biomedicine. It can have in, or pharmaceutical sciences, or indeed cell physiology, cell pathophysiology, <clears throat> microbiology, and all the basic natural sciences. We even do organic chemistry and some physical chemistry as well. Okay, so let's get started. By the way, uh, we took this picture uh, in Canyonlands uh, when we were there a summer or two ago. I don't remember which one. And, uh, so uh, I really recommend if you really want to have a beautiful experience, go to Moab, Utah and check out all the wonderful national parks that are there. It's a favorite playground for the Guerra family. All right. And has been for a very long time. Okay. So the paper we're going to look at uh, comes from the Frontiers in Immunology, published late in 2017. There's the reference and there's actually the link. So this paper is available online, as are all these Frontiers papers. Now, before we get into the paper, I'm going to give you some background. The background comes from a paper published in 2015 from Cancer Research. 
So the first part of this is going to be the 2015 discussion. Then we'll jump to the Frontiers in Immunology. Now, this Frontiers in Immunology paper is, like a lot of them, it's a review paper. So it's going to have not real um, data from individual experiments. It's going to, again, be a synopsis of the literature. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different than what I normally do in this venue, uh, but probably not that different. I about 50-50 deal with general review of the literature or go and dig deep into a specific two, three, four papers. So this is going to be kind of a combination of them. Okay, background. Tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or TILs, mediate immune surveillance and regulate cancer progression. Okay, so the gamma delta T lymphocytes kill tumor cells and secrete pro-inflammatory anti-tumor cytokines. That's a specific subset of T lymphocytes, the gamma delta. Okay. Now, however, a subset of that subset may actually promote tumor growth. This is what I alluded to. A specific gamma delta T lineage recruits immunosuppressive myeloid cells, thus inhibiting the anti-tumorogenesis platform by promoting angiogenesis. This results in a paradoxical tumor progression. So once we reveal this, we have to then determine what flips the molecular switch for the gamma deltas to go from, um, to differentiate into the type that, for example, are immunosuppressive to the type that uh, promote anti-tumorogenesis, right? So this is what we're talking about here. So the gamma delta Ts, as they're known, secreted IL-17 blockades. And when they do that, the anti-tumor response afforded by interferon gamma becomes uh, inhibited, okay? So that's the important thing to keep in mind, that one set of cytokines can actually block another set of cytokines, and in so doing, can reverse the polarity of the response. And obviously, we want the anti-tumor response when we're talking about the cell lineage. All right, so take a look at this slide here. Um, there's the um, link where I got this from. This is a government open uh, access um, site. So take a look here at the antigens. You have small phosphoantigens and amino antigens. You've got viral proteins. You've got glycolipids presented on CDI, CDI uh, molecules. And you've got stress-induced major histocompatibility class one related molecules. So you've got these various antigens different molecular structures. Some of them are lipids, some of them are peptides, some of them are proteins, some of them are carbohydrates. Okay. So the small phosphoantigens or amino antigens, they work for, through the gamma delta T cells. So do some viral proteins, so do some glycolipids, and yeah, even these stress-induced MHC class 1. So they're all working through that cell lineage, but some of them also work through natural killer cells, natural killer T lymphocytes, uh, and again, natural killer cells down here. So they, when you take a look at this now, innate lymphocyte, once the antigen has been presented, this is what happens. In some instances, tumor necrosis factor is produced and interferon gamma is produced. Okay? When that then occurs, it will cause a synaptic formation to a dendritic cell, which is also carrying with it an MHC class two plus a peptide. Okay, so this is has to do with T cell receptor mediated stimulation of the innate lymphocyte. Okay, so let's take a look at what's written down here. Innate lymphocytes, including the, the gamma delta Ts, the natural killer Ts, and just plain natural killer cells, recognize pathogen derived and self antigens on infected cells, tumors, and stress cell tissues. That's all that's going on in the left here. Their activation leads to dendritic cell maturation, presumably under conditions where the DCs are also presenting ligands recognized by innate lymphocytes. Okay, so for example, we're looking at the CD40, CD40 ligand here, and we're also looking at this MHC class II peptide. Okay, all right, that's called co-stimulation. So the DCs thus expand the innate response, that's the bottom right, okay, and also elicit adaptive immunity to process antigens, that's the top right of this diagram. So there's the CD4, 
CD, CD8 linkage, uh, lineages, okay? And that's the alpha beta T cells, okay? So that's expanding the innate and adaptive immunity, that's CD4, CD8 positive. Or we're going, the bottom right is expanding the innate response, and that's the uh, gamma delta Ts, the natural killer, and the natural killer T lymphocytes, okay? So it, the decision is made here. And the decision has to do with cytokines and co-stimulation, okay? It has to do with specific subsets of proteins that are associated with this synaptic cleft here. And what uh, eventually what peptides or proteins are secreted um, and then eventually induce the differentiation of these gamma delta Ts, for example. Okay? So cytokines and cell contact dependent molecules, these cell contact dependent molecules like here, mediate dendritic cell activation by different types of innate lymphocytes, whereas the dendritic cells produce cytokines and expand and differentiate additional innate and adaptive lymphocytes. So that's what's right here. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. So you start off with the antigens, and then depending on what the antigen is, you're going to get an innate lymphocyte that's going to secrete new cytokines. It's going to cause this synaptic uh, uh, synapse to form between a dendritic cell and this innate lymphocyte. Um, or it could be associated with a lice tumor cell. And then that's going to cause now the ultimate differentiation of these innate lymphocytes, either into the expanded innate and adaptive immunity, or again, this specific subclass. That's what we're talking about. All right. So classic gamma delta Ts are prototypical pro-anti-tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, or TILs. The mechanism is driven by T receptor, T cell receptor, excuse me, and the natural killer NK receptor mediated tumor cell recognition, followed by a gamma delta T activation, then cytotoxicity and production of the pro inflammatory cytokines. The two major players here are tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon uh, gamma. Okay. So the Gamma delta Ts fall into two major subsets themselves. The V delta 1 plus, that's predominant in tissues, and the V delta 2, which is predominant in circulation. Okay. So the anti tumor clinical efficacy followed in vivo administration of amino bisphosphonates. Okay, so it's a specific inducing molecules called amino bisphosphonates. That includes drugs like zoledronate or pamadronate, which selectively stimulate a subclass called the gamma, del gamma 9 B delta 2 T cells through metabolic accumulation of intracellular isopentanyl pyrophosphate, which is actually an agonist for that cell lineage. Okay, so that cell lineage, which basically we can just look at as the delta 2s rather than the delta 1s, See up here, you got delta 1 versus delta 2. This is a delta 2 subset lineage. They're going to utilize IPP or isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Now, those that watched the first of the series of this talk today will remember the IPP or isopentanyl pyrophosphate is the early precursor in the isoprenoid pathway, which leads to all of the prenal lipids that we talked about. Okay. So that means we're in the deep into the mevalonic acid pathway. So a subset of the gamma delta T cells is capable of secreting IL-17, interleukin-17, rather than the interferon gamma. Therefore, you get, there you get irreversible dedicated production of IL-17 or interferon gamma, and that's determined way back in the thymus at both the epigenetic and transcriptional levels. Okay. So that means at the epigenetic level, meaning like the modification of cytosine residues with methyl groups or acetyl groups, and then the whole histone code discussion we were describing uh, over several episodes of Vera of Med, which has to do with acetylation, methylation, uh, ubiquitinylation, uh, phosphorylation of histone, cohering histones to specific segments of chromatin that becomes remodeled and then is involved in the transduction of uh, the transcription factor to gene expression, Frank. So selected cytokine secretion 
segregates with CD27, which is associated with the interferon gamma production, whereas IL-17 production is restricted to CD27 gamma delta T cells. Okay, so that's the point that we want to bring up and discuss. So CD27 minus cells versus CD27 plus. All right. So here's another one of these excellent um, diagrams that I want to show you. Now remember, here's the biosynthetic pathway for isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Starts off with hydroxymethylglutarol-CoA. Then there is a reductase making mevalonic acid. Okay. Now remember, this comes from acetyl-CoA originally. Mevalonic acid, which the name of the whole pathway is named after mevalonate, first stable intermediate. There's a kinase, which makes mevalonate phosphate. Right? Then there's phosphomevalonate kinase, and that makes mevalonate pyrophosphate. Then you decarboxylate, and that's when you make the building block of, block of all the isoprenoids, which is isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Now, if you isomerize that to the dimethyl allyl, then you have both the C5 molecules, which will allow you to make the C10 geranyl pyrophosphate or the C15 after you add another mole of isopentanyl pyrophosphate, the pharnesyl pyrophosphate. Now notice that there are bisphosphonates which block certain portions of this pathway. One of them blocks here at the production of the geranyl. This is where you're adding an IPP, making going from the 5 to the 10. And the other one is when you're going from the 10 to the 15. So these are, again, these nitrogenous bisphosphonates, which block the pathway. So they're used in conjunction with mevalonic acid precursors to boost the amount of isopentanyl pyrophosphate. When you boost that, you will then uh, spe specify the gamma delta T cell fate. Okay. Now, if you don't block that whole pathway, you make pharnesyl the C15, you can continue to add C5 units and get to, for example, ubiquinone, okay? Or you can do things like geranyl, geranyl pyrophosphate, which is a C20, and you can get protein geranyl geranylation, which we talked about just the last lecture, or you can get direct protein pharnesylation. And all of those then are associated, with, again, with the further differentiation of all the cells that are harboring these isoprenylated, covalently modified isoprenylated proteins, depending on the specific moiety and the location of that iso isoprenylation, either a pharnesylation or a geranyl geranylation. This is C15, this is C20. Now remember also, this whole pathway, the mevalonic acid pathway, is linked to not just ubiquinone, not just to all this protein covalent modification, but also ultimately to cholesterol. So squalid and squalid epoxide, squalid uh, to cholesterol, to oxysterols, and then you have ster steroids themselves, bile acids, and in fact, even vitamin D all comes from this pathway. All right, back on with the glasses. So what are the pathogenic roles of gamma delta Ts? All right, now look at panel A. You have a blocking, you have, you have a process that blocks dendritic cell maturation because you have a gamma delta T reg cell. Remember, regulatory cells put the brakes on the T cell response. So they're putting the brake on dendritic cell maturation so you never make a synapse with a, a nascent or, in, or, or naive T cell with a dendritic cell, or it actually blocks uh, T cell responses, okay, with mature T cells. What kind? The CD4, CD8, and even the gamma delta lineages. So that's one thing. So regulatory gamma delta T cells can suppress anti-tumor immunity because they block the full maturation of dendritic cells and they block the effector functions of both CD4 and CD8 and indeed even the gamma delta T. So two different levels of um, ablation or inhibition of the anti-tumor event. Now let's look at panel B. Panel B, you have the STAT3 protein system or the jack stat pathway it's known as in T-cells, which normally induces effector T-cell differentiation. So STAT3 expressing gamma delta Ts produce interleukin-4, okay? And when they produce interleukin-4, they block the gamma delta specific subtype, which is going to make perforin and interferon gamma. 
So they inhibit the gamma delta, gamma delta anti-tumor response directly go using the STAT3 pathway because they are now generating an leukin 4 Okay, so producing leukin 4 then have a secretion of anti-tumor interferon gamma. So we block that and cytotoxic molecule porphyrin by so-called eomes um, and then the gamma delta T cells. The whole lineage then gets blocked out. Now, let's look at panel C. Interleukin 17 is generated from these gamma delta ROR gamma T cells. That's what they're right shown here. So interleukin 17 has to have a receptor. So again, depending on what cell type it binds to, mobilized inflammatory proangiogenic cell lineages, okay, the SPMs, by having the interleukin 17 bind directly to them, um, or with the secretion of interleukin 8, terminal cross vector alpha, and granulocyte um, uh, GM-CSF uh, um, uh, signaling molecule, you make the MDSCs, and then you recruit an immunosuppressive MDSCs we talked about at the beginning. So cancer cells interacting with that using this chemokine CXCL5 are actually going to be, uh, uh, when you get immunosuppression, okay, it'll block that. I mean, it'll, it'll unblock that because you're getting now immunosuppression. Okay. Likewise, cancer cells can produce VEGF and ANG2. This was a topic of a previous talk. Uh, and all of that is going to enhance cancer survival. And here it's going to specifically, because of VEGF, promote angiogenesis. So in leukin 17, just uh, capping, recapping, secreted ROR gamma T plus delta, gamma delta T cells is pro-tumor via mobilization of the inflammatory and pro-angiogenic TI2 expressing SPM. So you get recruitment of immunosuppressive MDSC cell lineages, increasing expression of proangiogenic factors of VEGF and ANG2, increasing in leukin 6 and STAT3 signaling in cancer cells. All of that favors survival. So this comes from a paper, in, the same paper of cancer research some three years ago. Okay. Three different ways that you get pathogenicity from the gamma delta Ts. So let's, let's put this together. The, the cells we're talking about represent a minor lymphocyte population that counts for less than 5% of all the CD3 positive T cells. Why are we talking about the gamma deltas? And they're found in the peripheral blood, but they predominate in organs like the intestine and indeed the skin. There are two major types of gamma delta Ts humans, which are distinguished based on the delta chain they use to make their T cell receptor. Okay, remember, that's a complex multi-subunit receptor complex. Uh, it's a complex complex, if you want to call it that. T cells expressing the delta-2 lineage paired with the V-gamma chain, so that's the V-gamma-9. So remember, delta-2, gamma-9, which we saw before. And they are, a great majority of the a gamma delta T cell population in the peripheral blood and secondary lymphoid organs of healthy individuals. In contrast, the gamma delta T cells expressing the delta 1 gene as opposed to the delta 2 paired off with different uh, gamma elements and their predominant uh, gamma delta T cell subset in epithelia, including skin and mucosa. Finally, a third subset expressed the so-called delta 3 chain and those come from the liver. Okay, so three different subsets total. Now, discrete and unique specificity of the delta-1 T cell receptor activation repertoire depends on genetics and epigenetics within an individual. So they are unique to the individual, okay? The, ga the gamma-1, the V-delta-1 TCRs are each individualized according to a specific human being. In contrast to that, the delta 9 delta 2s, or the gamma 9 delta 2s, excuse me, gamma 9 delta 2 lineage, that repertoire of um, uh, activation systems is far more restricted with an invariant uh, gamma, uh, gamma 9 uh, GP, so called JP sequence, excuse me. Okay, so understand you have two then different. Uh, ways of activating this TCR, a very specific one and a more general one. So the upshot is that 
the gamma 9 delta 2 T cell receptor has a restricted clonal proteome and thus responds to a limited repertoire of antigens. In fact, the gamma 9 delta 2 T cells recognize phosphorylated, okay, this is going to be the repertoire of antigens, isoprenoid metabolites, and we call these phosphoantigens or PEGs, okay? Now, this unusual response occurs without co-stimulation. Now, that's very exotic. Normally, the T-cell receptor requires full co-stimulation to have full effector status. Here, you don't need that, so it's working behind the lines. So, in the absence of processing, presentation, MHC1 restriction, all of which are part of this co-stimulation, you still get this activation of the specific T-cell lineage, okay? The gamma-9 delta 2s. So the PAGs then become something of interest to immunologists. They are indeed mevalonic acid pathway intermediates, but their concentration required for the gamma-9 delta T T-cell activation are not achieved in physiological conditions. So normally then, PAG concentrations only elevate to activating thresholds after a, an acute infection, like with a virus, or subsequent to a tumor transformation. So only then do you get an elevated mevalonic acid pathway, which is going to make the phospho uh, antigens from that pathway, because those are where those intermediates come from. So the gamma-9 delta-2 TCR works like a classical pattern recognition receptor which responds to metabolic shifts common in transformed and select or in certain infected cells, like virally infected cells. So you may ask the question, how do gamma delta T cells kill tumors in general? Well, the gamma delta T cell antitumor mechanism involves the perforin granzyme tumor necrosis factor related apoptosis inducing ligand or trail ligand pathway. And they also have the FAS and FAS-L interaction. Okay, so they have both of those components. So the moda modality of this is directed by the nature of the target cell itself. So even that further delineates and affects the differentiation, of course. All right, so let's take a look at this pathway. This comes from this 2017 paper now. Sorry that you can't see those very small molecules there, but there's... Uh, PD4, there's um, TXS, there's CDN, okay, and these are binding to their various receptors, okay. Uh, likewise, up here, you have these various, uh, on the dendritic cell or the tumor cell here, you have these various antigens interacting with their receptors, and depending on which of the cell lineages you've got, you either have stimulation from the tumor cell up here, or you have inhibition down here. So let's take a look at what it says. The upper and lower panels show stimulatory inhibitor signals um, derived from tumor cells to the left, and uh, uh, the D1s are to the left, and D2s are, the delta 2s are to the right. So remember, D1s and D2 are going to give different stimulatory properties and different differentiation of the effector cells. Okay, so those are the two subsets. The gamma delta T cell subsets are either these delta 1s or these delta 2s. Okay, so the, the gamma 9 delta 2 T cell lineages recognize via their T cell receptor using non-peptide phosphoantigens. These are the PAGs. They also use this BTN3A1, which I mentioned to you, uh, while the delta 1 cells, okay, um, uh, the TCR receptor ligands are not defined yet. So we really don't know what those are. Okay, not a question mark there. Okay, both gamma delta T cell subsets, both of them here, constitutively express surface natural cytotoxicity cell receptors, those are the NCRs, that bind to the mica um, uh, or mic B or the ULBPs frequently uh, expressed on tumor cells. Okay, so upon activation, the gamma 9 delta 2, okay, the gamma 9 delta 2, those are the ones here on the right, okay, this cell lineage here, express a, another uh, surface uh, protein called 
the FC gamma R3, or the fragment crystallizable receptor for IgG. And that can bind therapeutic antibodies and mediate antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity behavior. Okay? So those are the good guys in terms of anti-tumor activity. So if you look at these different tumors, either multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, follicular B-cell lymphoma, renal cell cancer, or acute myeloid leukemia, okay? So those are the various tumors there that we just went through. And then you look at the treatment using either directly these phosphoantigen, these, these compounds that are going to help block, right, block the um, mevalonic acid pathway so you build up that isopentyl pyrophosphate and also in the presence of the co-stimulatory and leukin-2 or not. And then depending on the tumor, there has been clinical trials showing a positive effect by using this stratagem. All right. So what are the strategies for the gamma delta T cell-based immunotherapy? They include an adaptive cell transfer of the gamma delta T cells expanded in vitro with zoledronate and interleukin-2, and the in vivo activation of the gamma-9 delta T cells by phosphoantigens. What are they? A couple of names, a couple that are available. Bromohydrin pyrophosphate or amino bisphosphonates like zoledronate. And of course, you need the low dose in a leukin-2 as co-stimulatory. There are novel gamma-delta T cell-based therapeutic strategies, and they involve biospecific or bispecific antibodies and the CAR T cells. Now, the CAR T cells are a specific type of cell lineage uh, where the antigens are variable, okay? So that's the idea with CAR T cells. You, you vary the antigen receptor, okay? When you vary the antigen receptor, you're going to get a whole different pleiotropic effect on those T cell lineages. All right, so we're going to stop there. Uh, what I wanted to show you was that the phosphoantigens, that particularly isopentaneal pyrophosphate, helps direct that final subset of the gamma delta T cells to either being uh, tumor promotive or tumor ablating. And that is associated with the secretion of various cytokines, for example, interleukin-17 versus interleukin-2. And not only that, that entire process will be reified or reinforced by the presence of major histocompatibility complex type 1 on the cell surface, binding specific antigens there, and a whole host of other receptor antigen binding contacts um, at that um, synapse, that immune synapse. So it's much more nuanced and complicated than we first thought. And this is why some gamma delta T cells are definitely a pro-anti-tumor and therefore are really good in the new armamentarium or, linea or, or therapies that we have for certain very resistant tumors. Or they are, in fact, pro-tumor growth. And again, this has to do with the co-stimulation patterns, and that is a unique aspect of them depending on the T cell lineage. So that's what I wanted to talk about uh, as part two. Very short talk, but I wanted to get you inured into this complex field. Again, I'm Dr. Dan Guerra. There's my specific email address. There's my Facebook where all these lectures are published and um, available for free uh, on YouTube. This is our email address for the company. Please contact us through that site. Or again, you can contact me directly through my email. Or you can go to the website and browse around and determine then that when you want to talk, to go to our formal email, and then we'll set up a time where we can discuss this. Uh, your specific biological problem, biochemical, cell physiology, pharmaceutical problem. Okay? So I'm not going to uh, take any more of your time up. I wanted to make this one shorter. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, which I know you've given me. Hopefully you'll see now why mevalonic acid metabolites are very critically important in T-cell differentiation. And that T-cell differentiation becomes the hallmark for whether or not you get a subset of gamma delta T cells that are either going to kill tumors or indeed proliferate them. And this has to do with this co-stimulatory package of various pro-inflammatory cytokines in association with how antigens are processed, the phosphoantigens in particular. So I'm going to close now by saying uh, my normal sign-off, which is goodbye for now.
Thank you for your attention.